I started with uh, I started with the guitar. My brother got a guitar for for his birthday. He was an older brother and uh, acoustic guitar. And uh, after a while, he was tired of it, and the guitar was too strong. So along with the guitar came a, a a book of chords. And so the mail bay, I don't know how many thousands of chords. And and so the guitar was good for me because I could go into a room like this and get away from everybody and learn at my own pace and not be embarrassed. The piano, no matter how much I tried, everybody could hear it around the house. And my grandmother was a piano teacher, so she was very strict and very disciplined. And so every time I tried something, do, doing something um, out of the box that was not on the books, she would correct me. And so the guitar was good. Uh, and I had a band with my brother, uh, a garage band, and uh, and then this other band that was already playing school dances and, and clubs and all that needed a bass player, their bass player left. And they were digging how I sang. So they wanted a singer, a singer, singing bass player. And they approached me and said, Marco, do you, can you play bass? And I said, probably, you know. Uh, I said, yes, and I hadn't played bass before. So my dad and I went and got a bass. And I worked on the five, six songs, whatever, to audition. And I sang, and uh, that was the beginning. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the fact that it was hard. It was. It took a little bit of work. The guitar, I kind of had it mastered. It was all chords, rhythm. It was pretty rhythm-wise. It was easy for me to sing and play guitar. The bass had a lot of counterpoints and a lot of different rhythms going on while I was trying to sing across the bar. So it was really challenging. It was one of these, you know. So it was challenging. Thank you, sir. And, uh, and so it was hard for me to uh, to do it at the beginning, but I it just got my attention. And then I started spending more time, and, and I got a little more fluid with it, and it became fun. And you know, 85 years later, here I am playing bass, and I'm playing less now, to be honest, than I've ever played. It's cool. Understand what your function is as a bass player. There was a band called El Ritual, which was the first um, rock in Espanol, Spanish rock band, to make it nationally and sometimes internationally. And so they were somebody I looked up to. In those days, Carlos Santana was brewing. He was, Carlos Santana was getting on the scene. Uh, there was a friend of his, Javier Batis, who was also a local guy. and. Uh, a band by Peace and Love, by the name of Peace and Love, a band Nahuatl, um, so many bands. A lot of musicians that I looked up to, and uh, in Tijuana and in Mexico. And I got recruited by members of El Ritual, which is my, my first official touring band. And they were, you know, they had a couple albums out, and they were famous, and I was 16, and I went from the garage band to national thing, you know, and uh, the rest is history, you know, that was the beginning of my career, really, at 16. No, I did a lot of things. The reason why I say that, the, re the reason why I use that is, a starting point is because um, up until that point I had done a lot of gigs, played with a lot of people, including in California and LA, I'd done some sessions and all that, but I was really messed up drinking and doing drugs and pills and everything. And so it was very blurry for me. I don't remember a lot of it. I just remember being really addicted to heroin and cocaine. I remember auditioning for people like Lionel Richie, Share, uh, to name a few, and many others. And uh, so when I met Bill, I met him in sobriety. I went to a treatment place and I got sober. 
which is 1987, September 20th. And so I met him in, uh, uh, a few months later, and he was getting sober, and Ozzy was trying to get sober. And so he approached me, he said, Mark, Mark uh, I'm doing a solo album, my first solo album, I would love for you to play it. Would you be into it? And I said, yeah, of course. So a few weeks later, I went to the studio, you know, and Jack Bruce was on the album, and uh, uh, Tim Bogart was on the album, I think Ginger Baker was playing, uh, Zach Wilde, a young Zach Wilde was on the album, and so on, so many players, a lot of my heroes. And uh, so I ended up playing on that. And uh, what happened after that, he decided to have, if the album did well, let's go touring. So he needed a band, so he asked me to participate, to be part of the band. And I said, yeah, so I'm on the picture of the touring band that never went touring. There was some, there were some problems, and so it just never happened. But, uh, but it was a great experience, and I love Bill, and uh, he's a very gentle man, and, and Great songwriter, great drummer, legendary drummer. We know that, and uh, so uh, yeah, I give that opportunity and him the beginning of my rebirth of me being sober in the business and really showing up for the first time. So that was my first. That's why I call it my first game. But I, you know, this is ten years later, man. This is ten years after, uh, or even twelve. After I've been playing everywhere and touring and doing gigs and bar gigs and, and sessions and traveling all over the world. And <laughs> It's not, you know, it's not for me to say and judge. Um, there's a lot more there than we know. There's years of um, disagreement, maybe. And, uh, it's a business thing. Um, and so um, I'm not involved, so I can't say this party's right, that party's wrong. All I know that it's a fan, it's a Black Sabbath fan. I would love to see the original lineup, all of them, you know? I'd love to see all four of them do a tour and give the fans around the world what they want, like me. It would be awesome. I saw them in, in Australia, in uh, Sydney, with Tommy. Tommy Confederus is a friend of mine. We worked together with Ted Nugent. We've done a lot of stuff. He recently did the KISS tour this last summer in Europe with the Dead Days. So I gave him a call and Tommy's a friend, you know, he's a great drummer. And, and he did a great job, he's amazing, he kills it. But, you know, knowing that Bill Ward is around, uh, it's like that, you know. It's, like, who wouldn't want to see, you know, me, for one, would love to see George Harrison, John Lennon, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr just do one gig, man. I'd be like, wow. So, it's what it is, you know, they, they really changed the, the world of music and um, all of them as a group. And it would be nice, man, to, to kind of be able to see that part of history, you know. Beyond that, I don't know what's going on with the business, with the contracts, I don't even get involved because I've been in that situation many times myself and uh, it's more complicated than people think. It's not just, okay, just do it. It's, it's more than that. Not really. I mean, if I had a choice, I would stick to, you know, the project that I love. And how can you not love playing with Ted Nugent, how can you not love playing with White Snake, Thin Lizzy, so circus and so on and so on and so forth. You know, Lynch Mob, I, I had a little bit of time with George there, George Lynch who did that, Smoke and Mares, and it was a great experience. But, you know, when, when you do this for a living, 
there's other factors that come into the equation, you know. Um, you have a family you have to support. You have, uh, you have a lot of things that you're responsible for, so you have to make decisions based on where I can flourish a little more and be more productive. Sometimes projects, you know, they will work a little bit and then they take long breaks. Uh, especially now in today's the way the industry is today. So if you work, if you tour for three, four, five months, let's say within Missy, like we would do, we're doing three, four, five months and then taking a break for two years, a, a year and a half. You get a call by Ted Nugent, or you get a call by Neil Sean, or Dolores O'Rean, or, uh, you know, uh, David Carverdale. You're gonna go because you have the time. And so it appears to the fans like you're jumping and you're leaving projects and all that. No, I'm just staying busy and I'm flattered that anybody would want me to be part of uh, their project to collaborate. So, yes, I go, you know. But uh, right now, my commitment is to the Dead Daisies. We have a plan um, and we've been uh, We've been doing a lot, man. We've been touring with bands like, uh, you know, Bad Company, Lemon Skinner, Aerosmith, Death Leopard, Kiss, Whitesnake, just recently, and on and on and on. So we're getting on the radar. You know, that's my commitment, the Dead Daisy. When I go touring and I get invited by promoters and fans and agents, why don't you come play here? You know, why don't you come do your solo thing? Um, I do it when I can. That's why I'm so fried. The voice is fried because I haven't stopped. But, uh, so that's what it is. That's a long answer to a direct question, but I love what I do. I'm gonna pay attention to my, my solo project because people die, like it. The reviews have been great. The responses have been great. We just did great shows in the UK. We did Sweden, Russia, Italy. Germany, <clears throat> and it's been great. So, and I really, really, really enjoy it. So I'm gonna start paying attention to that. So I can do some more writing and more, you know, fronting the band and, and kind of share my story with the fans, you know? So, yeah, music forever, man. I'll do it as much as I can, as long as I can. I'm gonna be like the Grateful Dead, the skeleton with the bass. I show up with a skeleton. That's why I want to know. One of the reasons we don't like to be being called an all-star band is because they don't last for the same reason. They're just one-offs. People get together, they do a tour, they record a DVD or a, or a live album or even a you know, studio album. And then boom, and everybody moves on to the other gigs and that's it. This is something that was really approached with the idea of continuing something, of, of really making a difference. And how do you make a difference? By hanging out and spending time together. So, so far we've, uh, you know, in, in a matter of two years we've done a lot of work and we're getting on the radar and we're getting on the map. So. Uh, Egos, <clears throat> we all have them, and we work in the studio um, pretty smoothly and pretty fun. We have a lot of fun, uh, so there's no problems there, you know. Um, I'm really looking forward to, this, to uh, spending time in the studio on this next album uh, because I know we're going to go in deeper, and the band is solid now. So, yeah, you know, super band. Whatever, call it whatever it is. It's a good band, I mean, we, we're putting on good, good music, and we're putting some good shows on. We're uh, really planning on hanging out for a while. My guitar player, actually, Soren, was here. He came in and, and hung out with us with Dead Daisies, White Snake, and and with Kiss. So whenever somebody is tied up for whatever the reason, prior commitments, we bring in somebody to cover. So that's the other reason why people go, well, is it a band or is it not a band? Well. Things happen, and we're moving forward, you know. So stay tuned to uh, the deaddaisies.com. All the info there. Get the next album, definitely. You know, 
know, this business is what it is. You're always writing, sketching ideas. Like right now, we're going into the studio with the Dead Daisies, so we all have sketches, ideas of hooks and, and, and verses and choruses and melodies, and, and we're always recording. On the road, I get a lot of downtime, so I, I record. I just did one in the room, actually, in the hotel room. So you don't plan it. The opportunities come up. Frontier, Serafino came up to me. I was touring with White Snake, and they heard me sing for the first time. I was singing, you know, doing some duet stuff for David, doing doing the, the Glenn Hughes uh, purple stuff on a couple of songs. And he heard me, and he liked what he heard, and he said, he called me at the hotel, can we have a meeting right away? So we had a meeting, and he said, what are you doing with your solo stuff? I said, well, I got this project that's like a Latin jazz funk. Thing, and I send him the project, which is amazing. I really love that project, but he wasn't interested. It's, it was too eclectic, it was considered jazz. He says, no, I'm looking for melodic rock. And this went on for a few years. He kept calling, we kept talking to each other and exchanging ideas. He says, Marco, you really need to do your thing, man. So, um, finally, um, he called me one day and said, you know, Richie Cotton is gonna have a little bit of time off and he really wants to work with you. And I, I said, I know, we've been talking. So, why don't you guys put it, put it together and do an album? And that's what happened. Um, Richie Cotton is great. It's somebody that's, you know, he's, he's amazing. He's a talented cat. So, to work with him was a great opportunity and I took it. So we put two weeks, that's all we did, two weeks aside. He, I remember he was touring in Japan, opening up for the Rolling Stones. And we called each other and said, man, and I was touring with uh, Whitesnake, maybe, or Ben Lissy. And we called each other and said, man, let's put from this day to that day. Let's not take any other work, let's do this. And we committed, and we went in there and, and did it. You know, I'm, I'm proud of the album, I love it. I wish I would have had more time, it's always that. But, uh, but what it did, it, it, got me on, it got me here to do my solo gigs, to play my songs, and, and hang out with you guys. So, yeah, it's, it was great. And then this other thing came up. is that Casa Mendoza, when Mascot approached me, they wanted me to do, they wanted me to do what, what I did with my trio, my Latin jazz funk trio. And uh, so it's a little more eclectic. It's like Latin funk jazz uh, with some original stuff and a few covers, you know, sprinkled with rock and R&B and fusion on top, if you can picture that. It's so pretty eclectic. It was all recorded in my six fretless, which I love doing. And, uh, there's some great songs. We're going to be actually, on my next one, we're going to be performing more songs from that album. Because people want to hear it. I keep hearing it. So, And that's the difference. Live for Tomorrow is meat and potatoes, rock and roll, southern rock, you know, with Ted Nugent on it, Steve Lukather on it, Richie Cutson producing, Doug Aldrich playing on it, um, Tommy Aldrich and Brian Tishy, and my son as well, Marco, on bass and my daughter on the cover, so, uh, and it's straight up rock and roll. This is more of a fusion, Latin jazz, funk, eclectic world beat, hip hop, funkin' trip. <laughs> See you soon.